So, uh, cover crops and crop nutrition. And the previous speaker touched on some of those things before, but I want to give you nice some background um, uh, on it so that when you get into a situation yourself, you know how to predict a little bit what the cover crop might do for you. So there's a couple of reasons why there's nutritional benefits with cover crops. Number one, they can trap some nitrogen. Uh, in the past, after we combine a crop, go out, soil sample, and sometimes the, the residual soil nitrate can be significant. So the idea with the cover crops is that uh, they can grow and use that nitrogen that the previous crop has left behind. So that reduces your fall, winter, spring nitrogen losses. And then the second thing is if the, the legumes might produce nitrogen if they have enough time. The previous speaker showed that using the relay cropping, and I'll reproduce that slide here in a little bit, uh, they can produce some in if they have some time. Uh, but if they're just in for a short period of time, maybe 30 days or so, uh, don't look for any miracles with that. But legumes could produce nitrogen if they have the time. So the release of nitrogen from the cover crops, and that's where the, the nitrogen comes from when you're raising a cover crop. It doesn't get squirted out the roots or anything. It, it comes from the decomposition of the, of the material. And that comes, uh, we can predict uh, pretty, pretty close anyway, what the release might be uh, from looking at the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the residue itself. It, uh, it can tell you if the if the nitrogen is going to be uh, trapped by the, by, the, by the decomposing crop, if it's going to be released so the next crop could utilize it, or neither. Some, some CN ratios are such that really none of that happens. It's just a neutral factor. Uh, and that's a, that's a case uh, whether you're going to put on manure or any kind of organic amendment at all, but it's, it's certainly true with a cover crop. So we'll go through a couple of demos here so that you understand what I'm talking about. Soil organic matter ranges from about 9 parts of carbon to 1 part nitrogen to 11 parts nitrogen to 1 part carbon. And average is about 10 to 1. So CN ratio about 10 to 1 is about what you'd expect in the soil organic matter. And that's important because the end product of any decomposition is CO2 and soil organic matter. So at the end, all residue decomposition goes into that 10 to 1 organic matter pool. So let's take a couple of examples here. Here's, here's sawdust, and uh, it has a carbon nitrogen ratio of about 200 to 1. So what, what do you think might happen if you put sawdust on the soil? I think some of you might already know, but, but uh, there is nitrogen in the sawdust, so if it decomposes, is it released or what happens? So I'll go through this little arithmetic for you uh, so you understand what I'm talking about. An average value for the content of any dry plant residues is around 45%. So if we use that 45% assumption and we apply 2,000 pounds of dry sawdust to the soil, what we're doing is, is applying 2,000 pounds of sawdust times 0.45 or 900 pounds of carbon. So when we, we apply that 900 pounds of carbon, the ratio is 200 to 1. So if we want to find out how much nitrogen is in, this, in what we apply, uh, we divide 900 by 200. And so we have about 4.5 pounds of nitrogen in the sawdust. In uh, a typical biological decomposition, this is a ballpark figure, but it's not too bad, about a third of the carbon goes into the soil as a soil organic matter, and uh, the other two-thirds goes into the air as CO2. So in our 900 pounds of carbon that we apply with the sawdust, 600 pounds of that carbon goes into CO2, and uh, the other 300 pounds goes into the soil. And at the end of the decomposition, that carbon from the sawdust is going to have the same ratio of nitrogen as the soil. So at the end, we have 300 pounds of carbon from the sawdust that's going into the soil, and it has a ratio of 10 to 1 with nitrogen. To make that happen, there has to be 300 pounds of carbon, and it needs to have 30 pounds of nitrogen for that 10 to 1 ratio, but the sawdust only had 4.5 pounds. Where the other 30 came from, it came, came from the soil. 
So 25 and a half pounds of nitrogen was required in order to decompose that sawdust fully. So a sawdust with a ratio of 200 to 1 carbon to nitrogen can tie up nitrogen. So this is an example of something that can tie up nitrogen. Uh, wheat, wheat residue, wheat straw is another one that has a carbon nitrogen ratio of about 80 to 1 to 100 to 1 and that will tie up nitrogen too. So how about a cover crop? Uh, let's go through a scenario here. Your wheat comes off in early August, field seeded to oats. It comes off after, after rain about a week later. By the end of October when the soil temperatures get down to about zero and it kills it, you figure there's about a ton of dry matter per acre. And the uh, oats were yellow-green in the middle of October, so there was some nitrogen there but not a huge amount. So with that you should assume maybe around 2.5% nitrogen on a dry matter basis. So let's take all those assumptions. We have 2,000 pounds of oats, and it's 45% carbon, so we again have 900 pounds of carbon uh, per acre. At 2.5%, the amount of nitrogen in the oats is 2,000 times 0 0.025, because the 2.5% is measured on a dry matter basis, not on the amount of carbon. So, so we have 50 pounds of, of nitrogen per acre in the oats. The CN ratio of the oats cover crop then is 900 divided by the 50, 900 pounds of carbon divided by the 50 pounds of, of nitrogen, so it's 18. After the oats decompose, we have 300 pounds of carbon and 30 pounds of nitrogen because of the 10 to 1 ratio. And since we had 50 pounds per acre of nitrogen to begin with, then uh, we have 50 minus 30 or 20 pounds of nitrogen that can be released sometime in the season. So generally, uh, residues with a CN ratio of over 30 tend to tie up nitrogen and not release it. Residues with a CN ratio from 20 to 30 won't affect the nitrogen status of the crop short term. And the residues with a CN ratio of under 20 tend to release nitrogen. And those residues like that they have fairly low CN ratios, very green residues. If you have, if you have any kind of residue, I don't care if it's oats or rye or turnips, tops or beets or, you know, just dream up anything. Anything that's just really green usually has a nitrogen content of around 4%. So you can use that as a ballpark figure to figure out what you have. And those very green residues are going to release the nitrogen the quickest. So this is from a uh, European journal. You know, I, I, I think as you go through here, and I think as you go on through the morning, and I apologize for not being through the whole thing. My day started out in chaos and is ending up that way. Um, the, um, what you're finding is, is, is most of this research is kind of in the middle, that we know some things about things, but we don't know everything about things. And so I, I guess a word of caution for you to do anything is to kind of go go to this, what, uh, moderately, uh, with your eyes open. Uh, don't think that any of this is just real firm science, and the annual climate certainly has a great implication on how successful any of these things are going to be. Anyway, in this, uh, this study conducted uh, in California, uh, they looked at the cover crop decomposition in conventional and organic fields, and they were all the same. Uh, the half-life of that oat vetch cover crop incorporated was between 13 and 38 days. So if the soil's warm, temperatures are good, you have good moisture, a lot of that really green residue can decompose really, really fast. Their initial effect on that was that it tied up nitrogen for a very brief period of time, and then after that, the uh, CN ratio declined back down to its 10 to 1, and that's usually what happens. <clears throat> this will work out in Massachusetts, and the people on the east and the south have been raising cover crops for some time. They're probably 10, 10 to 15 years ahead of us as far as, as far as research goes. And the reason they were interested in it is, of course, there's great, there is great uh, public pressure to, uh, to clean up any kind of nitrogen that comes off their fields. Uh, they're in a much wetter climate than we are. Uh, 10 to 20 inches of rain more than we have, and their their seasons are very extended. In fact, their winters hardly have any freezing soil in them at all. 
And so cover crops have been a part of things for quite some time. So a lot of the things that we we work with and and look at and try to figure out how it's going to relate into what we're doing here in North Dakota uh, come from the east or the south. So what's happening here is we have um, there's uh, several different nitrogen rates uh, in each one of those each one of those curves. And as you can see, they kind of plop on top of each other. So the nitrogen rate that was used in head of the cover crop, the residual nitrogen they had to work with isn't nearly as important as when the cover crop was, was tilled under. And here, is, this is a winter cover crop, and so they've allowed it to grow all winter, which we don't have the luxury of doing, of course. But they had let it grow all winter, and then on the 1st of May, they, they went in and, and uh, incorporated it. <coughs> And then uh, another series of treatments, they incorporated that about two to three weeks later, and then about two to three weeks later. So what you're seeing is a decomposition time. So, so we're seeing dry weight remaining in the soil from May 1st to June 1st going down about two-thirds or so, and steady stating out at around, uh, around 20% for that early uh, incorporation and around 25 30% for the second and about a third or so for the for the third. So, as when they went into the season and got out of the coolness, got into the more dry conditions, the decomposition rate was slower, uh, and uh, they ended up with more dry weight, more residue at the end of the decomposition period during the during the drier part of the summertime. <coughs> what also happens when the when things? Let's see if you see this little arrow. You see the little arrow? Yes, we can. Okay, here's a little arrow. And we'll just look at the first incorporation date, that May 5th. And this is the this is the zero end rate, 60, 120, 180 pounds before their before their cover crop was was grown. Uh, as uh, as you go through time uh, here, with, let's uh, let's give it what 60. That's more likely our conditions. We have a we started out with a ratio of about 29 or so. As it as you go along, what happens is that the more resistant materials to decomposition are left, and the nitrogen is utilized. And so as you go through decomposition, uh, the the CN ratio increases. As you put on more nitrogen, the CN ratio decreases within each one of these treatments. You see it goes from 29 to 24 and from 44 to 35. And so that's what happens. The greener the things are, the, the, the higher, the lower the CN ratio and the decomposition over time, the residue that's left, uh, not the stuff that's in the soil organic matter, but the residue that you're seeing uh, is really, really high CN stuff. And it, takes more nitrogen from the soil to to get that to rot. This is what happens in our environment. This is the mineralization rate right through the season. This is how fast things rot. We look at, at uh, and there shouldn't be a tail here. Uh, this is just an artifact of the program. But anyway, if we go into March, it's really cold. There's ice in the ground. Nothing's happening. As the soil warms up, we have have this burst of activity out into May and early June, and this is the peak. This is the peak of our of our uh, residue mineral mineralization rate. And then, as we go back into the fall, then the things go down quite a bit. And so, as we go out into September, October, or so, uh, when a lot of your fall cover crops are going to go, uh, a lot of that mineralization doesn't happen in the fall, and that's a good thing because if it did, then we might lose that nitrogen over the winter time. So. So it goes down to this very almost zero level, and then the real decomposition of those residues happens then in April and May, and that's a good thing for all, all of our crops because those are the periods when the crop is going to need it most. So if we do get some nitrogen stored in the fall of the year, then we can expect it to be released fairly early in the springtime. Because that's our crop growth, spring wheat. We're putting it in in April sometime, hopefully. Uh, and and so the nitrogen, the peak of the nitrogen mineralization just precedes, or just just hits that area of really really uh, rapid growth and nitrogen uptake. So it's it's not a bad it's not a bad mix. All right. So how do you do this? There's a couple ways to do it. I'll show you two ways. This mo this first way is the most scientific way. So if you have a 
If you have a little scale, uh, you can pick these up at a hardware store for, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks or so. What you do is you go out with a square, uh, you know, put some PVC pipe together or so, and throw a few of them around, and you collect <coughs> the the uh, above ground plant material from that foot by foot material. Uh, you dry it, uh, and then you weigh it. And uh, so, if you have uh, 2,000 pounds of dry matter an acre, that's going to weigh 20.8 grams on a foot by foot basis. So, in another way, you know, for every one gram that you find per square foot, that's roughly 100 pounds, you know, exactly, pretty close to exactly 96. So if you want one gram is 100 pounds, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. So that's one way that you can measure how much you have. And then if you figure that your, that your cover crop tops are very green, then you should assume that it has about 4% organic matter, and then you can kind of figure out about how much nitrogen is left from the carbon-nitrogen ratio at the end. Uh, every 100 pounds of dry matter is going to contain 4 pounds of N per acre for the next crop, then figure about a third available if it's conventional till, or if you're in no-till, you can't figure that much because the decomposition is slower, so about 20% if it's no-till and one pass seeded. So those are the numbers you need in order to figure out what you have if you want to do it scientifically. But <clears throat> if you don't have that much time and math is not your friend, then you could do it this way. If you have if you have a cover crop out there, and you've seen pictures of cover crops that completely cover the field, once you have the, the field completely covered with the cover crops, with an annual legume, a pea, let's say, uh, you, you, you grew peas, you dissed them down, and then you have them come back up again, and you have a six-inch height, that's 2,000 pounds of dry matter. And every additional inch in height is about 150 pounds of dry matter. So you could do this with just a yardstick. If you have rye or any kind of a uh, annual small grain, uh, eight inches high, completely covering the, the field, a really dense stand, that's around 2,000 pounds of dry matter. Let's give you an example of... of, of of what we see sometimes, this is a, a field that I work with in, in a corn study this year down by Rutland. And the grower had, had uh, fall cover cropped and then grazed and then uh, strip tilled in the fall and then planted in it in the spring. And in between the rows, you can see the residue that's left. In the fall of the year, it looks monstrous. But once cows come through, it doesn't look a whole lot different than just having bean stubble out there. A lot less dense than if you have wheat stubble. A lot, of, a lot of cycling going on in this field, though. The, the grower's been in no-till for over 20 years, so he has a lot of helpful bugs in the soil that help to turn that stuff under. Another reason I put this in here is because this is, this is my only, what, attempt at, at cover crop research, if you want to call it that. Uh, but I had 20 sites this year in my corn study in the east. A couple of them were out at Carrington that Greg Endress took care of. Uh, but most of the rest of them were in the east, and this one in, in Rutland was the only one in Sargent County. Uh, and it was the most efficient use of N. Uh, I gave, um, if you figure out the total available N that, that, was, uh, that I could figure out, uh, he would give a 50-pound credit for long-term no-till. That's something we found in our wheat research a couple of years ago, and it seems to so far be valid in the corn research I've done. He has a 50-pound credit because the organic matter is over 6%, so that's another 50-pound credit. His residual nitrate before the, before the study happened in the spring was 68 pounds, but then I subtracted off 30 pounds of that because he had a really good wheat crop the year before, and so I subtracted 30 pounds off for excessive straw. So... Uh, he raised about 190 bushel corn uh, an acre with uh, around 138 pounds per acre of known available N plus the 40 pound N rate. So it's a little bit less than a pound of N per bushel, which was my most efficient site. So we're going to be working with him in the next couple of years on some, some uh, sites that also had cover crop and, and see if they continue to be different from the other sites that I manage. Right now I don't know if this is real or not or if it's just a, uh, 
an artifact because it's it's not replicated. It's just a, a site that's different than the other 19. I want to I want to put this in here um, to see how well your glasses work. No, I put, want to put this in here to um, show what happens when you put multiple crops in. <clears throat> when you put multiple crops in, it's it's kind of like putting a crop and a weed together. Uh, there's a lot of talk about cocktail mixes and all that's great, but there are certain there are certain plants that are going to just kind of take over. So this is this is some work with some oats seeded with a clover crop, uh, and what we're seeing over here is if we're looking at the total biomass over here, the two of them together, uh, let's say up here at the at uh, August 5th, uh, they're looking at over what two and a half ton or something like that a total biomass but but over two and a half ton of that is is the oats only a very small amount of that is the is the clover the clover really doesn't take off until the oats give up and that's what you'll see a lot of times if you put lots of things together that the more aggressive plants the ones that like that whatever conditions are there when when you're seeding them uh, those are going to take off and tend to dominate uh, if you continue to grow uh, after after a while, until that aggressive thing is either cut or or uh, dies away, then the other crop is going to take over. But uh, if if you're seeding thickly enough to be a very good cover crop, I would try to tend to avoid things that are going to smother the other things out. Especially if you're going to put it in the fall of the year and it's only going to grow, say, you put it in middle of August, and you've got September and October that you can really count on before the weather turns horrible. So uh, in that 60 days, you just want to make sure that you have that that you spend your seed dollar wisely and put things in that that are actually going to have a chance of being of assistance to you. Not not like this. If we gave this 30 days or so uh, from the, from this planting date, you'd have decent growth with the oats, but but hardly hardly anything with the with the clover. So so think about what you're doing before you do it. Make sure that that all the crops are going to do well. The thing to, thing to remember is the cover crop legumes are only going to make nitrogen if two things happen. One, they have a long enough time to work, which means more than 30 days. And the second is if there's plenty of residual nitrogen afterward, they're not going to make, make any nitrogen at all. They'll still be green, they'll still be healthy. Uh, they may even nodulate, but as far as nitrogen production themselves, they're not going to make any nitrogen until the nitrogen in the soil is depleted. So the last couple of years has been a no-brainer. You go after after small grains, and the nitrogen in the soil is extremely depleted, and so that really hasn't been a problem. But uh, let's go back maybe three years ago, West River, when they had the drought, and they had 100, 100 120 pounds of nitrogen uh, in the soil, and then maybe you got some rain afterward, uh, and then you try to put in some legume to to get some more nitrogen. That legume won't won't make a pound of nitrogen because all it's doing is just sucking up the nitrogen in the soil. So uh, think about uh, think about the benefits of legumes, especially if they're going to be if the seed is going to be much more expensive than something else that you could grow. If you do grow a cover crop. And you're not, of course, not putting any nitrogen on there. Your job is not to feed the cover crop. Your job is to feed the crop that's going to pay you. But if you put a cover crop in and you find that it's kind of yellow-green or even yellow, uh, the chances of that really supplying any nitrogen for the next year are very, very small because, again, the CN ratio will be so large that uh, it, it, it probably will just be a neutral factor to the coming coming year. There's some work with this uh, a number of years ago, back in '95. There was a year when there was a lot of volunteer grains after wheat harvest, and so a member of our department went out and and took took uh, took residue from areas where the where the volunteer wheat was green and yellow green and yellow, and he found a good nitrogen contribution with the really green wheat, a so-so contribution with the yellow green wheat and if the wheat was really yellow it didn't have any nitrogen benefit the following year so that's another thing to keep in mind as you're looking at your fields and figuring out trying to figure out what the benefit might be the next year so that you might be able to take a credit so um, 
A lot of the green things, hairy vetch, uh, for example, has a nitrogen replacement value of about 50 to 70 pounds an acre. There's probably a lot more nitrogen in in the vetch than that, but this is this is what's available. Remember that some of that carbon is going back in the organic matter, so not all of the nitrogen that's that's being produced by these crops or held by these crops are going to the next crop. So, uh, again, if you figure out that you, you have, say, I don't know, 80 pounds of nitrogen uh, in in a in a cover crop. Uh, don't give a 80 pound credit because only a portion of that is going to be used by the next crop. And then uh, in uh, their study with the rye, uh, if they killed it directly, had a, a seeding, and actually had an initial negative nitrogen replacement value, 20, 30 pounds of N per acre. Uh, and they got by this by killing it a couple weeks beforehand, whether whether you want to do that. A lot of times we get such a hurry in the springtime because we have to. Uh, all the water we've had lately that we don't have the luxury of waiting a few weeks in order to plant. So uh, with, with certain cover crops, depends on, on how much nitrogen they have in them. They could have a, a negative nitrogen replacement value if they don't have enough nitrogen in them. One of the things I worried about when people started putting oilseed radish in the ground was that that family of crops uh, does not uh, support mycorrhiza, which is a fungus, a fungus in the soil that supplies a lot of our plant families with uh, phosphate and some micronutrients, zinc, for example. Uh, and a lot of our crops, corn, uh, wheat, soybeans, sunflower, are very dependent on the mycorrhizae in the soil, flax particularly so. Uh, but the mustard family crops and lamb's quarter family crops don't support them. So I was worried that if if we put out oilseed radish, that maybe the next year we went into a crop, we might get into some phosphate deficiencies because the mycorrhizae was decreased. Well, there was a study, what, last year published that... Uh, the mycorrhiza wasn't in, in, inhibited by the cover crop. I guess you know it's not around long enough in order to to make the mycorrhiza population go down enough that it hurts the next crop. Uh, rye actually enhances the the mycorrhiza, and I think a lot of other other plants uh, would too. But uh, the oil, oil sea radish, all of those family crops, you'd expect sugar beets to be the same way. Uh, those don't seem to inhibit. The, uh, the mycorrhiza, if grown just for a very short period of time. If you grew them all season, they certainly would, just like canola uh, contributes to a fallow syndrome after canola, and uh, sugar beets contributes to fallow syndrome on corn. So how about studies that looked at uh, the yields the next year? Uh, and, and these have been, what, uh, all over the board. Some have seen some... Some seen some advantages and some have not. Uh, there's a, a recent study in Iowa. I uh, started looking at um, at cover crops and they used an interseeding of of cure clover, uh, which is an adapted clover for that area, and it didn't influ influence the soil nitrate before, during, or after the season. It seemed to be a neutral factor. Uh, sometimes the excessive clover growth reduced the corn yield, and I think this had a lot to do with the the water. Uh, situation during the year. Uh, the suppression of the clover during the corn growth resulted in similar corn yields uh, in uh, in both the cura and the non-cura system. So it, it, I guess the bottom line the Iowa study is it really didn't wasn't very helpful to them. Cons Condell, which some of you, some of you know, you know, I don't know if he's on the program today or not, but you know if he's if not, maybe he should be given us, but. He's done a lot of work at, at NDSU during his um, uh, days as a Ph.D. candidate. Uh, he worked with intercropping sunflower legumes, and I've, and I've seen this done in, in the organic community. They've done this for a very long time. Uh, they used um, at five site years and Prosper and Carrington, Black Lentil, Harry Vetch, Yellow, Yellow Blossom Sweet Clover, Snail Medic. Seeded at the time of sunflower seeding, it reduced the yields. Except with black lentil, it didn't seem to, and the yield of sunflowers wasn't suppressed when it was seeded at V4, V10, so that was good. And then the biomass of legumes at later seeding date ranged from about 
1,500 pounds for the V4 seating to about 800 pounds an acre for the V10. Uh, so uh, he, one of his conclusions was that the sweet clover seed of the V4 could act as a cover crop for the next growing season too since it's a biennial. So there were significant legumes produced with this method. In a companion study, he also looked at what happened to the wheat crop afterward, and what he found was that the spring wheat seed the year after the sunflower uh, wasn't really enhanced by the intercrop legumes. Uh, and couldn't really explain why that was, but the data supported that that was the case. What he didn't show was, could he save any nitrogen, and, and I don't know if he brought that out or not. I don't think he did. So most of our cover crops, you know, it's thinking about cover crops after we combine corn or combine soybeans, I think is is most years going to be uh, a non-issue because they're late enough in the season harvesting that there's really no time. So most of our cover crops are going to be seeded after a short season crop such as barley, canola, or spring wheat. And then you've seen uh, the data from this before, uh, the relay cover crop, just uh, grow on an annual legume and then let it grow, grow again. Uh, also, the, the organic growers do this sometimes with buckwheat. They'll let the buckwheat grow, and then they'll disc it in, and the buckwheat comes up again, and then they'll turn that down as a cover crop, and it actually helps their phosphate nutrition. So we can do that with the, with the field peas, and that works pretty well for the most part. The, uh, when you look at the, the numbers here, 63, 69, you can generally assume that after a pea crop, you're going to have maybe 20 pounds of N in the top couple feet. Uh, so probably about 40 to 40, 40 to 50 pounds of this end uh, is due to the nodulation. They had enough uh, time between the harvest and uh, that uh, mid-October date when they read the biomass that they're getting about 40, 50 pounds of in. And here in the really, really thick stands, where as the as the uh, presenter uh, said, they didn't have their combine set as well as they should, they could have. Uh, they they really uh, had a lot of nitrogen produced in that in that situation. And then one more thing I wanted to mention: uh, we haven't talked about moisture at all, uh, but I think in these times of uh, excessive water, that just having an uh, an extra crop out there to use more water is a good thing. And Fifteen years ago, somebody would never have talked about this. Because uh, at that time, you wanted to save every drop of water that you wanted to. But there are many times during the past 15 years, 12 years or so, you know, since, what, 92 or so? This has gone on for a long time, hasn't it? That uh, we've had excessive water. So sometimes for certain crops, having something else out there that's using water is a good thing. Uh, this is a Minnesota study, and I, I worked with uh, this study, too. They got much better results than I did. This is this is soybean that is chlorotic, uh, and this is uh, no nitrogen uh, with a cover crop over here. This is oat seeded the same time that the soybeans were applied were put in. Uh, they dust the field with the oats, and then planted the soybeans on top of them. So here, without the cover crop, we have lots and lots of chlorosis, and here we have a little bit, but they're much more robust and green. These are both pictures shot the same day. And then with 100 pounds of N, with residual N out there, uh, with no cover crop, the soybeans are really, really suffering here. The excess nitrate in the soil actually increases the amount of, the amount of chlorosis that you have. And here with a cover crop, uh, again, uh, much, much greener, much taller, much healthier. So, so by taking some nitrogen from the soil, they're helping this, but also the biggest benefit, as you can see up here, where there wasn't any nitrogen applied at all, uh, is just the moisture conservation. As the soil becomes drier, there's more, ni there's more iron available for the plant. When the, when the soil becomes saturated, uh, that's when bicarbonate is produced and, and the chlorosis becomes uh, really bad. So. Uh, if a person has a real chlorotic field, an old cover crop, and then kill it with Roundup or another another herbicide, is uh, not a bad not a bad cultural tool to try to get rid of some of that chlorosis because it, it can injure the plants a lot. So I'll summarize this: the cover crops have the ability to tie up available in and protect it from loss. 
Uh, the timing of the cover crop release is, you know, of nitrogen is critical to its success, uh, but I don't think we have a problem with that given the amount of mineralization that happens in the fall and in the, and in the early spring. It, it seems to nick pretty well. The carbon-nitrogen ratio of the cover crop helps to determine how much nitrogen is becoming available. And the legumes in the mix may or may not have time to nodulate and produce N in many years. So they need about 30 days. If you don't have that, then it's, uh, it's not going to be worthwhile to pay extra money for them. And then also, this whole cover crop thing is, is driven by a number of, a number of factors. Uh, but when you go out and look at field tours and different things, I, I want you to keep something in mind, that when you're evaluating it, remember that data without replication is not data. It can be evaluated critically. It's, it's really no more use than coffee, sh coffee shop talk. Uh, if, you, if you look at, at what the grower has done, and he does it in replicated strips, uh, and has a yield monitor or some other way to measure measure the progress and, and relate it statistically. Uh, has an oversight partner as a collaborator. That's that's real data, and uh, that's what takes so long on our end and to give really firm recommendations about something so complex as this. Is that uh, it takes time and energy and patience to get data that's that's really really useful. So with that, I think I can take some questions if you have some. Are there any questions for Dave? We got one over here, Dave. What's the question? I might have to repeat it. Has any work been done on using any of these types of cover crops to speed the breakdown of land coming off the CRP? The question was, has there been any data or experience in using cover crops to break down land that's coming out of CRP? I mean, break down the residues? I assume so, yeah. The, the yeah. And cycle to speed that up. And speed up uh, the nitrogen cycle, all that type of stuff. No, I don't. I don't know of any. I, I think something like that would would still be long term. It, it takes a while for to get an, enough cycling and enough diversity of your microbiology uh, you population in order to make that work. Yeah, um, Dave, they've got an ongoing one down at Pingree Ron Wiederholtz and. Uh, the Stutzman County STD had one looking at that. I don't have any of the data, but I know they did start that. Yes. To, they did the cover crop. Not they had, This year was their test crop year. So the cover crop went in last year? Their cover crop would have went in the fall of 09, summer, fall of 09. But I haven't seen any of the data. But that's a, that's the only thing that I know of. Okay, we'll have to take, we'll have to get a hold of that. 